Hello everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we're going to be revising vectors. Well, let's get started with the difference between scalar quantities and vector quantities. First off, we're going to focus on scalar quantities which have a magnitude but have no direction. What are some examples? For instance, length is a scalar quantity. So that's one example. Mass. You know, it doesn't make sense to say that something has a mass of 5 kilograms at a direction of 5 degrees to the north. It just doesn't make sense. It's a scalar quantity. It only has a magnitude. Speed is, um, is another quantity which is a scalar. Temperature as well has no direction. So temperature. What else can we think of? How about, how about volume? So the volume is a directionless quantity. Energy as well, really interesting, is a scalar. So just measured in joules, it has no direction whatsoever. The potential difference, which is the amount of energy per unit charge, is also a scalar quantity. So potential difference is another one and let's also include power so the energy per unit time that is also a directionless quantity now what is a vector quantity a vector quantity has both a magnitude and a direction it is typically expressed by an arrow for instance if i had a force of i don't know let's say five newtons the five is the magnitude and the direction is defined by the direction of this arrow. For instance, this arrow in particular was 23 degrees to the horizontal. And we can define both the magnitude and the direction of this quantity. Now, what are some other quantities which are vector quantities? The vector quantity it for which is kind of an equivalent for distance is displacement that is the distance traveled in a particular direction so displacement is one velocity is another one this is the speed in a particular direction acceleration is a vector quantity definitely has direction force as we've just shown, has both a magnitude and a direction. Another one, momentum, for instance, is also a vector quantity. One more thing I would like to discuss in a tiny bit more detail is the difference between distance and displacement. Imagine that you are driving a car, let's say, and you start from point A and you want to go to point B. Oh, we don't go in a straight line. Maybe you take a few turns like that and you end up going at B. Now, the distance traveled will actually be the length of the path. So the distance will be equal to the path length that has been traveled. The displacement, however, will be given by the following vector like so. So let me just draw this vector here in blue, which is our displacement. So in this case, well, the, displace the displacement is defined as the uh, distance traveled in a particular direction. So this is really, really important. If we had a path, let's say we start at A, we go around, we go around, we take some sort of a path and then we go back to A, then the displacement is actually zero. Like so. Okay, now that we've looked at the difference between scalar and vector quantities, let's have a look at some simple cases initially for adding vectors. If the two vectors are parallel or 
anti-parallel, we simply add the two quantities if they're in the same direction. For instance, I have this point here, it could be a sphere, it could be an object with two forces acting on it. One 4 Newton 1 and one 2 Newton 1 and both of these forces are acting to the right. Therefore, the resultant force will be 6 Newtons acting to the right. If they were acting in the opposite direction though, we would subtract we would subtract the forces with leaving us with a resultant force of 2 newtons to the right. What if I had two perpendicular vectors though? For instance, I have a 4 newton vector acting straight upwards and I have a 3 newton vector acting to the right. The first rule that we need to apply is to move the vectors so that they are tip to tail. For instance, at the moment you can see in this diagram here that they're tail to tail. So let's just move them so they're tip to tail. So I'm going to just redraw my 4 Newton vector over here. And this is quite important for the later stages when we look at the direction of the resultant. Afterwards, all we need to join, all we need to do is just join up the vectors as shown and the direction of the resultant will be given by our, well, by our resultant vector. This over here is our resultant vector. Let's, uh, let's call it F resultant or F subscript R. Now, how do I find the magnitude of this vector? I have a 4.0 Newton vector and a 3.0 Newton vector. So in order to find the magnitude, all I need to do is essentially use Pythagoras' theorem. So Pythagoras' theorem says that fr squared, the hypotenuse, will be equal to 4.0 squared plus 3.0 squared, which means that my resultant force or the resultant vector will be equal to the square root of 4.0 squared plus 3.0 squared, which is the square root of 25, which is 5.0 newtons. So now we know that the size of this arrow is 5.0 newtons. We don't really know its direction though, so we don't know the magnitude of this angle. And this is really, really important. Now, in order to figure out the direction, we can use some simple trigonometry. One of the easiest ways is just to use the tangent function. Now, remember, let's call that angle theta, for instance. The tangent of this angle theta will be equal to the opposite over the adjacent. Now the opposite in this case is 4.0, the adjacent is 3.0 newtons. Now let's just use the inverse tan function, so theta will be equal to the inverse tan of 4.0 over 3.0, which is going to give us approximately 53 degrees. And now we have both the magnitude of the vector and its direction. One of the most important applications of physics is the opposite of vector addition, which is resolving vectors into the individual components. Quite often we might be given a vector, for instance a force, and all we would know is the magnitude of that force and the angle at which it acts. Well, we could represent this force by two equivalent vectors. This 5 Newton vector can be represented by two components. One which is a horizontal component, which will have this size, like so, and um, one vertical component. Let me just draw the arrow of the horizontal component and let's draw the vertical component. If you actually think about it, if you were to apply a 5 Newton force at 30 degrees, this will be equivalent to applying some horizontal force and some vertical force. Now how much exactly? In general the rule is that the opposite component 
which is this one over here, will always be equal to the size of the hypotenuse, in this case that's 5.0 newtons, times the sine of the angle. The adjacent component, on the other hand, will be the size of the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle. Now, where do those rules actually come from? Let's derive them. First off, if we think about the definition of the sine and the cosine, I'm going to start off with the sine. I'm going to say that sine of 30 degrees is equal to our opposite, opposite over the hypotenuse. Now, our opposite, let's, let's just call our opposite y, like so, divided by a hypotenuse, which is 5.0. Now, let's rearrange for the component y. I'm going to find that y is going to be equal to 5.0 times sine 30, which is the expression that we had before. So, 5.0 times sine of 30. Now, where does the 5 cos 30 actually come from? I'm just going to get rid of it just for a second so that we can rederive it. Now, the cosine of 30 in a right-hand triangle is simply defined as your adjacent over the hypotenuse. I'm going to call my adjacent just simply x because that's the horizontal component. So this will be equal to x over 5.0 which is my hypotenuse. Let's rearrange for x and we're going to find that x is equal to 5.0 times the cosine of 30 degrees. So x is 5.0 times the cosine of 30 degrees. And we have, we have successfully managed to resolve the vector into two components. The vertical component will be equal to 5 sine of 30, which uh, is actually equal to 2.5 newtons. Let's highlight that. And the vertical, the horizontal component, excuse me, will be equal to 5.0 times cosine of 30, which if we put that into a calculator is equal to 4.33 newtons. And let's highlight that as well. So this 5 newton vector is equivalent to a 2.5 newton vector pointing straight upwards and a 4.33 newton vector pointing purely horizontally. Let's do one more example to make sure that we've really mastered resolving vectors. So we have a 7.0 Newton vector that is acting at a direction of 20 degrees to the vertical. This vector could be represented by two further vectors. So one is going to be purely vertical, like so. It's going to be along, along here. Let's draw that one out. And uh, we're also going to have a horizontal vector which will be acting, well, purely horizontally. What are the individual sizes? First off, notice that now in this example, the opposite is actually my horizontal vector. So it's always worth just drawing, uh, drawing it out, drawing the diagram out to make sure which one is going to be the sine and the cosine component. As I said, the x component, or the opposite component in this case, will be given by the size of the hypotenuse, 7.0, times the sine of the angle, so it's times sine of 20 degrees. Now, this time, why have I chosen the sine for the horizontal component? It is simply because this is the opposite of the 20 degree angle. As you can see, it's lying opposite to it. So 7.0 sine of 20, if we were to put this into a calculator, we're going to get 2.4 newtons. Now, in order to find the adjacent component, so this one here was the x component, let's call the adjacent component y, because that's the vertical component, we we'll simply use the size of the hypotenuse, 7.0, times the cosine of the angle, which is 20 degrees. And if we were to put this into a calculator, we're going to get approximately 6.6 .6 newtons. So those are the individual sizes of the y and x component. 
Not all vectors, however, are perpendicular. We're going to be looking at three different ways of adding non-perpendicular vectors. The first one is probably the one which is most rarely used, but it does come up occasionally in exams. And that is the method of a scale diagram. We use this method if the question says that the, that the diagram is shown up to scale, or you may be given a scale itself. It could, for instance, say something like one centimeter is equal to 2.0 newtons, and you would need to work out the final length and the final force from this scale. Now, if we are given such a question, what we need to do is the following. First off, we need to arrange the vectors tip to tail. They may already be given. For instance, let's have a look at those. We have a three Newton vector. That's the tip of one and that's the tail of the other. So they're already tip to tail. The other or the next step that we need to do would be to carefully draw out our resultant vector. In this case, let's draw it in a different color, the resultant vector will be along this line like so. And we would literally very carefully use our ruler to carefully measure the size of this vector with the ruler. That's why it's absolutely vital that we bring in rulers to our exams as well because we may have to do a measurement with the rulers in the exam hall. If a scale diagram is not possible, then we could potentially use the rules of sine and cosine to determine both the magnitude and the direction. For instance, if I have a three Newton vector acting to the right, and I also have a five Newton vector acting in this direction, I could add them using the cosine rule. First off, I need to make sure that the vectors are tip to tail, which they are. So here is the tip of one and uh, here's the tail of the other. I'm going to draw my resultant vector, which is going to be along here. So let's just draw that quite accurately. Like so. Okay, well, let's call our resultant vector. Uh, I'm just going to call it F for resultant force. Now, the cosine rule says that a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine theta. Okay, well, we can directly apply this rule and we can say that f squared will be equal to 3 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times 3 times 5 times the cosine of the angle between them, which is just 120 degrees times cosine of 120 degrees. For to put this into a calculator, we're going to get 7.0 newtons for the magnitude of the force. So now we have the magnitude, which is 7 newtons. What about the direction? We need to be able to define at which direction this vector is actually going through in space. In other words, we're going to be looking for this angle. and I'm just going to call it theta. Well, we could use the sine rule to determine it. Remember, the sine rule says that, well, for a triangle of sides A, B, and C, let's just write it down that the sine rule is that a over sine of a is equal to b over sine of b. Okay, well, let's apply this for this triangle over here. So the angle opposite or the side opposite to this angle that we're looking for is five newtons. So what I'm going to write down is that 5 newtons over the sine of the opposite angle, which is theta, theta over sine of theta will be equal to, well, let's pick these two. So we know that F is already 7.0 newtons. We've, we've found this. So this will be equal to 7.0 divided by the sine of 120 degrees. 
Okay, well, let's do a little bit of cross multiplication. So this times that equals this times that. In other words, 5.0 times sine of 120 will be equal to 7.0 times the sine of theta. Now, sine of theta will then be equal to 5.0 sine of 120 divided by 7.0 and our final step will just be to use the inverse sine function so theta will be equal to the inverse sine that's that is that is what we input into our calculator 5.0 sine 120 divided by 7.0 just be careful and make sure to include all the brackets in the right place and if we put that into a calculator up to two significant figures we're going to get 38 degrees. So we now have a value for both the magnitude and the direction of this vector. Now our final method of calculating uh, the addition of non-perpendicular vectors is using vector resolution. This is the method that I've used extensively in physics research as well and uh, it is a very very important and very very useful one. For instance, if I had a 5 Newton vector that I wanted to add to a 3 Newton vector and the direction between them was 60 degrees. What I could do is simply remember that this 5 Newton vector can be represented by two vectors. One will be purely horizontal and this one is going to be added to the 3 Newton vector and the other one will be purely vertical like so which uh, it will be providing the vertical component. Now the horizontal component in this case that's the adjacent component to, to this angle will simply be as we've mentioned the hypotenuse times the cosine of 60 degrees. Now look at that. Horizontally suddenly we have two vectors to add. We have this sort of blue vector but we also have this gray vector with, because they're both acting purely horizontally. So let's just say that the total force in the horizontal direction, so let me just write this down as fx will be equal to 3.0 newtons plus 5.0 times the cosine of 60 degrees. Now if we add this to or if we use a calculator to do that we're going to get about 5.5 newtons. In the y direction it's a little bit simpler because the y component will be given by 5.0 times the sine of 60 degrees just by using vector resolution. So Fy will be equal to 5.0 sine of 60 degrees which is about 4.33 newtons. So in a way now we have the components of the resultant vector. 5.5 overall in the horizontal direction and 4.33 in the vertical direction. So in order to find the magnitude of the resultant vector all we need to do is use Pythagoras. So let's do that. I'm going to say that f will be equal to the square root of 5.5 squared plus 4.5 3, 3 squared. I've just simply used Pythagoras' theorem and my resultant force will be equal to 7.0 newtons. Now I still don't actually know the angle of the resultant vector because my resultant vector is not the 5 newton vector, now it's a 7 newton vector which has changed its direction somehow and I don't really know that angle. So what I could use is simply Pythagoras uh, could simply use some trigonometry again to figure out the uh, the angle. In a way all I know is that I have a 7 Newton vector which has the following components. fx is 
5.5 newtons and Fy is 4.33. So I need to figure out my theta. Well, let's just use the fact that tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So that's going to be 4.33 divided by 5.5. Okay, well, theta will be equal to the inverse tan of 4.33 over 5.50 and um, if we were to put this into a calculator we're going to get about 38 degrees and we have once again found the magnitude and the direction of the resultant vector okay guys hopefully this video was useful this was the vast majority of the vector calculations thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.